somebody once asked me, are you a pessimist? I said, well, no, but I am real about lots of things in life that I've seen only because I don't claim to have seen it all. I don't expect to understand it all and I don't even participate with those that know it all. Although some people think I know it all. No, I tend to ask God for wisdom because frankly there's a lot of things I don't know anything about. But he always seems to lead me to the place where I can learn about things that I'm interested in. And I'm very interested in just about everything that involves human nature and human beings and people and life in general. Now there is something that most people seem to forget about the book of Revelation and it's always interesting to me because in the book of Revelation, you know, Jesus, we're told, one of the first scenes that we see, you know, in the book of Revelation is John is taken up into heaven, obviously, because he says so. He says, hey, how's taken into heaven? Come up hither. So it's like, okay, there's no debating that. And then we see Jesus walking in the midst of the seven menorahs you know, it says candelabras in some Bibles, but basically it's a seven-branched menorah, not a Hanukkah, which is perversion of what God inspired the original tabernacle to be. And whenever you see a Hanukkah, it's not a true God-inspired biblical holiday. It's just something made up by religion, by Judaism, by some Jewish priest who said, you know, I think I'll make up a miracle. And sure enough, they proved him inaccurate. But the point being is that John records accurately what he saw. He saw Jesus standing in the midst of seven candelabras. They weren't s symbolic, they weren't significant, they were literally what God does in relationship to his church. And so standing in the midst he then begins to speak to each messenger that's in the church or each angel and he speaks directly to the people that are in those churches and he says to those that overcome he doesn't speak to the church it's kind of interesting that way you see even though he's walking in the midst of the seven churches he's talking to the people the individuals and that's one of the things that we need to recognize no matter where you are whether you're in a mega church a mini church, home Bible study, a cyber church, a extended campus, you know, these weirdo, to me, weirdo, wacko, I mean, to me, in my mind, maybe I'm wrong, because like I said, I don't know it all, but as soon as a church adds a campus, I think they're off the wall. <laughs> no offense to them, but you know, no, I don't see any man of God being all that good that he should be more, you know, broadcast all over the place like he's some kind of demigod. No, I think that he could just as easily go to the people and let's eliminate the cameras. Have 12 services, I don't care, but be real and be with the people. Make it smaller and more intimate, not bigger and less intimate. Do you begin to realize what happens in a megachurch? You know, as you're beginning to see rock stars of Christianity. You know, I kind of call it the the um, rock star Christian, you know, is that there's no longer pastors, there's rock star Christians. You know, they're rock star evangelists, they're rock star preachers, they're rock star teachers, but they're sure not pastors. Because you see, a pastor handles a flock. He kind of like, you know, knows them and calls them by name. He's able to speak to them personally. He's able to touch them and carry them in his arms. Jesus is the good shepherd. I don't see that in rock star Christianity. And that's kind of where Christianity is at right now. It's into rock star Christianity. And Jesus addressed that because he knew that mega churches and campuses and all these weirdo, wacko ideas that Gentiles get. And it's the Gentile idea because it's not a Jewish thing because Jews really don't quite get into that, really. You know. Once you start adding cameras and everything, they're kind of going, uh, you know, you still need to have, and, you know, talk to any rabbi and they'll tell you about it. <laughs> Believe me. One of the tenements, one of the adamant truths about Orthodox Judaism was that 
And it's an expression in Jewish culture that says, I want to see him tie his shoes. Now, we would say, you know, Gentiles, you know, or if you're living in a Gentile culture, if you're Jewish and living in a Gentile culture, you would say, I want to see him put on his pants, you know, or everybody puts their pants on the same, you know. That's a colloquialism, meaning that what do they do in real life? And that's what it means by they want to see him put on his shoes, because in order to follow a rabbi, you had to live with the rabbi. That's why Jesus chose 12. To be a follower of Gamaliel or you know any of the great leaders in, the, in those days, you had to live with them. You had to be there with them in their living quarters to study with them and to apply yourself, to understand. You know, I recently uh, posted a teaching from one of the Calvary Chapel pastors that said something about three hours a day, five days a week, two years. And that's how long that this Bible college thing, training thing that he's got going, that's what they do. For three hours a day, five days a week, seven or two years it takes to graduate. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. You know, I mean, but the first thing that came into my mind was, well, in Jewish culture, it's like, you know, you got to live with the rabbi for a couple of years. I don't know how many years, but, you know, long enough. <laughs> you know, that you know the person, you live with them. Probably three and a half. <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting? But that's kind of why, you know, we see Jesus talking to individuals in the letters to the seven churches as opposed to talking to the church. Because, quite frankly, you could talk standing on a pulpit and not have anyone listening. Really. You could be up there on stage and everyone else is texting, you know, and they got their iPads and their earphones on, you know, and they're doing their own thing. You know, and then you just, oh, well, I trust God, you know, take care of that part. I don't. As a matter of fact, you know, I remember, like, at Big Calvary at times, you know, Romaine having to say, hey, you know what, don't bring in your cameras and don't bring in your, you know, phones and turn your phones off and everything else. You know, and maybe some churches still do that where they tell them they have to take, turn their phones off. Or maybe now they think that they're being cute by texting during a service. You know, well, let's have a cyber text while we're having a live presentation so that we can all work together coordinating our efforts in technology to worship our God. Well, okay. My only question is I hope you get the right God down. <laughs> No offense. But you see, that's why Jesus spoke in the letters to the seven churches to individuals. That's why even here, when I use video, I say to you, look, you know, you want to talk. You want to get real. Come over. You want to know where I'm coming from. Come see me. Visit. Stop. You know, knock on my door. I'll probably show up sometimes looking dressed like this because this is who I am. The reality of what I do in my day is talk about Jesus all day long. Not just three hours a day. <laughs> that's who I am. And that's what I want to know about you. You know, if I was discipling you or if I was teaching you. I had a pastor, uh, I had a friend of mine who used to come over to my house to pick me up for prayer and then drop me off. He would come in the door, just knock on the door and walk right in because, you know, I'd be in bed or something or whatever. But we got to know each other personally and intimately. And I love the man, you know, he was very, very wonderful, you know. He's down in Arizona, from what I understand, a guy named John Lindy. You know, a friend of mine told me that he's down there successful, you know, praise the Lord, God bless him. Um, but the point being is that without living together, you don't know whether it's a preacher or a teacher. Because anybody that stands up, you know, and just preaches is a preacher. I'm sorry, no matter what you think of, your definition of a teacher. A teacher is not somebody who stands up and gives a lecture. That's not the way it works. That's more of a preacher. Now a teacher provides the tools, the inspiration, and the information to assimilate together the environment for learning process to envelop a person that's responding to questions and answers and being tested on it in order to grow. Now, supposedly in evangelicalism, we say that somehow the Holy Spirit is doing that 
and that he is taking you through your life circumstances to test you and to prove you and to take all those things. And so it's not the pastor's responsibility to be a teacher or a preacher or whatever he may be in a mega church. It's your responsibility because he's off doing his thing, you know, going on cruises or doing whatever he does, you know, and praise the Lord, he's probably right on. I don't know. If he's in a mega church, I probably won't even get close to him because, quite frankly, mega ministers don't get close to mega people. They only get close to important people, not the poor and needy, do they? Unless there's a photo op. Sad, isn't it? But that's the facts. So, what I see more than anything else is there's a lot of showmanship in our rock star church, in our rock star preachers and teachers and pastors, as opposed to reality of Jesus. When we share Jesus in a personal and intimate way on video, you know, we want to talk about what Jesus is doing in our lives today. I want to know how you, Mr. Rockstar, relates to me. I don't want to know what you think and you learned and you know you did on your own, you know, and now you're in charge of, you know, whatever. I want to know how do you relate to me? Because I'm not a rock star. Matter of fact, I don't even drink power energy drinks. <laughs> I'm just a human being and a poor slob that just happened to be sharing with some other poor slob the gospel. I'm somebody that's poor and needy who would like to say to every other poor and needy person, there's hope for you not to become a rock star, but rather to be found by Jesus sharing from the letters to the seven churches the hope that lies within them that they can overcome those rock star ministries and that they would be saved in spite of where they go, what they hear, and what someone else may be doing. I don't know about you, but I personally can't get there. You know, I can't really go there. I I have been raised up, you know, inside of the mega church. To me, that was mega. You know, and by today's standards, it wasn't. You know, it had three services, but so what? You know, they were small. You know, the building, but the only three services. People say, well, you know, you, you got to get involved in the cell groups or the home Bible study groups. Of course, they're always big, you know, and, but you have to get involved in this, that, and the other thing. And I always think, I have to do what in order to get what? You see, I don't see that in the book of Revelation. I don't see that in the Gospels. I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. As a matter of fact, I kind of see that when there's a mega church, the message usually isn't very depthual, is it? It's kind of, as a matter of fact, it's kind of like, you know, superficial. It kind of goes out there, but it's kind of like, you know, got this kind of like, you know, floats some jet some kind of feeling. It kind of floats on top of the waves of the people. You know, it kind of goes out over the airways, and it's kind of like, yeah, that's nice, you know, and it kind of floats, you know. But it doesn't really have much meat to me, or much depth. It doesn't really grab me and say, you, you know, you need to listen. You need to realize, hey, look, this is this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where reality check is. You know, and it doesn't confront me to discern between the floatsome and the jetsome, the fleshy and the carnal, the spiritual and the spiritually deceptive. I have a problem, I admit. Because I don't know everything, and I don't understand it all. I don't see how that fits in the Word of God. I do see how many people came to Jesus, and then he would say something, and many walked away. I do see how thousands got saved, and yet only few were discipled. I do see that how the parables of the seed that falls on good earth will produce fruit and an abundance. But I also see that Jesus warned something very interesting about the harvest. And that's what I wanted to really mention about these rock star ministries. Don't worry that there's millions there, or thousands, or campuses, or everything else. Jesus said, hey, let the wheat grow up with the tares. Because that which is good, I will separate from that which is flax. I'll toss it in the air. I'll mess up their life. I will cause the circumstances in their world to be shaken to the very core and foundation and see who really is in the Lord and who's in 
the rock star church. So, I don't know about you, I might listen a little bit to some of these rock star ministries, you know, and sometimes I post them, you know, I mean, I do. I post a lot of, you know, kind of mega maniacs, you know, out there that are doing their mega whatevers, you know, and God bless them, you know, if that's what God's told them to do, go for it. Me personally, I'd stick somebody else in charge and walk away and go start something somewhere else. And I keep going somewhere else to start something. I wouldn't keep taking all the money and you know and then say, oh well, now that I got all the money, I can do better ministry. I can reach more people. I can do more and be more effective. I only have one thing to say. Are you really that effective? Really? You really think all those people are listening to you? <laughs> okay. God bless you. Be at peace. Go your way. But for me, I'm going to have to look at the Word of God in the book of Revelation and examine again the letters to the seven churches and kind of question for myself when he's speaking to people whether we shouldn't be keeping ourselves humble and meek, tender-hearted towards one another, gentle to all souls as much as possible, but also not really participating in these rock star venues, this rock star effect where we're stumbling each other and bumbling and fumbling the ball when it should be. Who really is it need? And who could we go to that isn't inside of this venue that holds thousands of people when we need to go outside of the venue to meet someone who needs us right now? I think I'd rather have a tent than have a coliseum.